Um, good evening and welcome to our final session for the day. My name is Cecilia Okoth and I work with a new vision as a multimedia journalist. Um, I will be moderating this session which is titled Earth Crimes, Investigative Journalism, Corruption and the Environment. The gist of this conversation will, will be about how newsrooms use investigative and data journalism techniques to expose corruption and crimes related to the environment. And I'm pleased to have a panel of seasoned experts who have been doing a lot on environment reporting. So just to introduce them briefly, I have Emma Laura N. Kisa, who is from Eldoret, and she's um, a data analyst with Code for Africa as part of their Pan-African Knowledge Team, who has worked in the media and communications field for 13 years. She's a Uganda National Journalism Awards 2017 nominee in the data journalism category and has been a part of numerous award-winning projects. Emma has a strong interest in early childhood development. Welcome, Emma. Then I also have Rosemary Okello Olale, who is a director, Africa Media Hub, Strathmore University Business School, Nairobi. Rosemary is a well-recognized communication, media, and gender expert who finds interest in creating Africa narrative, Africa's narrative through data storytelling. Currently, she's a director, Africa Media Hub, and just to summarize her bio, she has supported the media sphere as a platform to give voice to visibility to marginalized people and, and the transformation of the alternative media into a critical voice of civil society. She's a co-founder of African Woman and Child Feature Service, a media NGO where she served as an executive director. And she's also a founding member of the Kenya Media Council. Welcome, Rosemary. And then we also have Frederick Mujira, who will be joining us shortly, is a um, multiple award-winning journalist, environmental journalist, and development communication specialist from InfoNile. Oh, there you are, Frederick. Welcome up on board. And um, Thank you. Finally, I have Ronald Mosoke, my colleague seated next to me. He's a journalist with the Independent Magazine in Kampala, Uganda. Ronald is a a Ugandan multiple award-winning journalist with special interest in reporting on the environment, agriculture, business, and human rights, among other bits. Um, he is a 2013 beneficiary of Biosciences for Farming Africa Fellowship. He's a 2014 nominee for the David Duster Journalism Awards. And he has won a number of um, awards and um, nominees from the Uganda National Journalism Awards, right? Yes, welcome. welcome. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. OK. Just to give a preamble about the environment, and I know my colleague, Benon, talked about the environment when we were discussing water and trees. Um, crimes in the environment are done secretly and by organized rackets and mostly by powerful people. This kind of crimes also involve huge exchanges of money. So um, just to pick on the presenters, um, I would want you to share how you executed your investigative stories around the environment and probably what you experienced during, dur during your tenure of work. So let's start with Emma. Emma Thank you so there? much, Cecilia. Oh, yes. Thank you all for having me. I have a presentation and I'd like to start sharing that. I am asking the hosts to enable me share my um, screen. So, go ahead. I will be talking about some of the stories that we have worked on and we have been working on these stories collaboratively with uh, our Code for Africa team, Code for Africa region team. So it has been a collaboration with other organizations and other institutions and uh, the biggest part that we have been working on is the data part the data side of an investigative story and uh, that is what I want to 
mention in this time. So thank you so much. I have got the access and I will be sharing that screen right now. Okay, so this is what we are going to talk about and that is me and just briefly I'm going to be talking about uh, investigate earth crimes as well as the data because that is the side that we have been working on as Code for Africa and the team that I work with. So to start with, I'm just going to look at a number of uh, definitions. So environmental journalism. First of all, just journalism relating to nature and the environment, just uh, in case we have anyone here who does not know that. And then investigative journalism, which is just unveiling matters that are concealed and when you put that all together, you will get what we're going to be talking about, which is uh, investigative journalism on uh, earth crimes and uh, environmental journalism. So with all of that that we have talked about, what stands out is geojournalism. So that is generally what it is about, what environmental journalism is about. And it's a combination of data journalism and traditional reporting through features such as geotagging, custom mapping, and interactive graphics. So that's according to Earth Journalism Network. And then geojournalism.org uh, defines it as the practice of telling stories with data generated by the art sciences. And as we continue, you're going to see what I mean by that. But these are some of the stories. I'm going to just show two of the stories that we have worked with. Uh, sucked dry, which I'm sure someone else on this panel is going to talk about, but sucked dry was a collaboration with Info Nile and its network, and this is an award-winning project that we worked on, and it was about land that has been acquired by foreign investors in Africa, and this is just along the River Nile Basin. So it was a collaboration across countries that are sitting on the Nile Basin. So that is one of the stories, investigative stories that we have worked on uh, with uh, environmental journalism. Another one is this one, which was done in South Africa, and it was called Kruger's Contested Borderlands. It is also an award-winning one, and it was about buffer zones um, along the border of Kruger National Park and just how they were acquired. So displaced communities were in there and land grabbing was in there. So this is another story that we have worked with along the environmental journalism, um, investigative journalism way. Then and we have uh, this, it's called Mine Alert and it is a project that is done, uh, carried out by Oxpeckers and it's a project that shares mining activity information, and this is to promote public and private sector accountability in the mining sector. So MineAlert is a project, a large project, and we are currently working with their desk, their uh, journalistic desk, uh, to release uh, articles about that and give them data where necessary and uh, visualizations of all the amazing stories coming out of this great, great uh, project that they're having that is called Mine Alert. So that's just some of the stories that we have worked on about investigative journalism for the environment. Now I'm going to look at the data. As I said, that we, our part is mainly the data part in all these stories that I have showcased. So for the data, um, first of all, I will just say that uh, visualizing environmental and earth science data by doing that, we are able to back up our storytelling and investigations with scientific evidence. So that is where data comes in. It's not enough to just say, all right, but you need to have data backing you up and backing up the story that you are writing. And that gives us um, evidence. And then we can have a work that is uh, that someone can stand behind. You can stand behind your work because you have data that is backing you up. It gives you credibility. Data gives us credibility. So that's one of the things. Another one is that gen, uh, this is from geojournalism.org in relation to data and in relation to data for investigative stories for environment. And it says, journalists cannot complain about the lack of data when they have to report about the environment. Scientists have been collecting information about our environment in so many forms, 
for so many years. So I, I include this because on our continent, we are not a, a documentation people. We do not have a lot of data. And that is what most people think, but not for environment. We have had uh, data that is about environment and it has been recorded for many years. So uh, the last part of that note says that dealing with quantity is more of a problem than suffering from scarcity. So the data is available. The data is available for uh, investigative journalism on environmental issues and it is out there and you can find it. So that is what I want us to know. Now I'm going to show us just a few of the sources that we have for data that investigative journalists can use when reporting on environmental issues. One of these, so this is just a, a drop in the, back, in the bucket of the amazing data sources that are out there. Um, one of them is the sites database. So we have worked on this on different stories that were about um, wildlife so this is a, it's managed by UNEP and it, it currently holds 13 million records for trade in wildlife so you have rhinos elephants uh, pangolins you can find um, how much money was uh, it was sold for how many the quantities of all the illegal trading that is happening so this is a convention on international trade in endangered species so this is a site where you can go to for that data to find out data for this topic and it ranges it's a time series data you can it has a number of years in there so you go in there and choose the year range you want and you find data on endangered species and the trade in that so that's one of the data places that we go to another one is the global forest watch i know that it was mentioned earlier today because uh, one of our partner uh, the speakers earlier had used Global Forest Watch, but it is a, it has a mine of, of information on forest cover and everything around forest, tree cover loss and all of that. So it's an online platform that provides data and tools for monitoring forests. So if your story on the um, environment is leaning towards forest, Global Forest Watch is a brilliant place to go to get data and they have a lot of that and it is near real time so you will it you won't find very old data if you do not need it because sometimes you will need to make comparisons they, they have data from way back but they also have a near real time data so that is one of them another brilliant tool that we have found a brilliant place to find information is the climate knowledge portal and this one is information about disasters. So climate related information and you will find information about earthquakes and droughts, epidemics, floods, landslides and storms. And this is across uh, many countries. It has a lot of data and you choose the country you want to report on and you'll find the data. If you're doing a collaboration across countries, you still will find all that data in there. So this is another tool that is uh, run by the World Bank and we have used it in many of our stories on environmental issues. Lastly, I will talk about Google Earth. So this one here, you'll find time series data of uh, a 3D representation of the Earth based on primarily satellite imagery. And this one we have used in places where we want to see before and after. So this is how this, uh, let us say, um, land was. And then maybe it was a swamp and then it was reclaimed illegally by someone in who has the power to do that. And then now this is how it looks like. So it is a brilliant source of information when you want to look at a before and after of where a place is and geographically and it's, it's brilliant that it's a 3d representation of the work so these are just a few of the data sources that we use in our storytelling when we are working with the environmental story um before i okay we have also the earth journalism network now this is not a tool this is a community that i suggest that it would be good for journalists that are listening to us to be a part of this if you are a journalist working with the environment this is a very good place to be mm -hmm. so there, there's a lot there's a community around environmental journalism so as journalism network is um, a good one to try out to 
Lastly, before I uh, hand over back to you, Cecilia, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that when we are do working with investigations and we are working with journalists who are working on investigations, we remember or we want them to remember. And uh, one of them is you have to read widely if you're going to be doing investigative stories so that you get story ideas. And uh, it's very, very important to be well read. Another one is to follow published stories. So if you uh, want, you're looking for ideas, the best investigative stories have come out of a story that has been published, and then you uh, follow up on that. Then official and NGO reports, they are brilliant places to get ideas for investigations. Investigative reporters should use whatever channels they can to keep up to date. So yeah, make sure you're up to date with what is happening and what is in the news. There are various information services uh, like embassies, non-government organizations, and these offer free reading rooms, libraries, and inter internet access. So if you think that you, you don't have a lot to, to access what is needed, there are places that where you can find free access, free access to internet, free access to reading, and you can use this in your investigative work. And finally, you can access internet. If you can access internet regularly, then you look at sites and social networks. That is also a brilliant place to find investigative ideas and investigative stories. So uh, lastly, on this, I just wanted to say that journalism is a ro the role of being watchdogs. And an investigative story looks beyond criminals to a faulty system. So you will not be finding one a person did this, but find the system behind the person that has allowed this to happen. So that is the bigger picture of investigative uh, journalism. Having said that, uh, back to you, Cecilia. Thank you, Emma. I like the bit where you say we should familiarize ourselves with online platforms that have data on the environment. There's a lot that is in, in the internet, but most of us tend to you know, bypass this, and yet rich content is always available on the internet. And I also like the bit of reading widely, because you never cease to get, um, to, get to know things. So Rosemary. Um, I know that the environment is not one of the interesting topics in the newsroom, and that's probably why not many people cover it. But then if you also add statistics into the equation, it gets boring. So speak to us about the techniques on how to expose corruption and crimes related to the environment. Thank you, Cecilia. And, uh I think I'll, uh, that's uh, me, but I'll, uh, uh, my, my internet is unstable, so I'll uh, switch it off a little bit uh, until I finish here. Uh, I'll also have got a presentation uh, uh, that I'd like to make. Uh, but can I be made the co-host so I can uh, do my presentation? Uh, I promise I won't take long. Uh, Go ahead. Can I share? Okay. I'll do. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. Let me just. I'm just trying this technology so I can be able to share. Got so many. I'm looking for it. It's not showing here. Wow. I thought uh, I have it here. So the PowerPoints are not. Uh, is, some, is something wrong with my sharing of the screen? Because I'm um, not able to. Rosemary, you could probably you could probably yes. carry on as. Um, that, that technology Let me is just working. carry on as okay then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you then. Yeah, I'll pick up from what uh, Emma talked about. Uh, 
actually there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting stories when it comes to uh, business uh, uh, um, environmental and also even uh, land issue when it comes to investigative journalism and um, it doesn't have to be political and many a times people especially journalists uh, they t can tend to uh, connect injustices to be political yet injustice can be even things that are happening within the community so when Ida Tarbell published her article in 1933 on John D. Rockefeller, monopolistic, and you know Rockefeller is the greatest philanthropist that we have excesses, that I couldn't doubt her, Miss Tarbell. It took some time before Tarbell actually and her colleagues made an impact, but the investigation they carried out led to one of the most intense waves of reforms ever known, and that was almost two years later where the standard oil and unreasonable monopoly and order was dissolved. So investigative journalism has spread around since then, around the world in the past decade. And we've known that during our times in the newsroom, if you're an investigative journalist, you're actually held in high esteem, but the politician also looked at you suspiciously. And you feared for your life as a journalist. And uh, simply because you are helping hold the corrupt leaders accountable, document human viol rights violation and expose systematic abuses in developing and transitioning areas, even in the communities. But despite Rainer's laws, legal and physical attacks and supportive owners, especially lack of uh, qualified sometimes trainers that uh, might not understand what investigative journalism are about, the journalists have actually uh, have been able to progress and they have made investigative journalism become what it knows. In the uh, development uh, communication, especially in environment, you can actually say that investigative journalism is what has made the, the sector become vibrant and become even what it is today. Without investigative journalism, maybe land issue could not have been discussed. Maybe ownership could have been an issue. Maybe the rights could not be an issue. So when we talk about investigative journalism, what does it mean? It, defi it defines that uh, it varies among professional uh, journalism group, depending where you're coming from, but it's a systematic, in-depth, and original research and reporting, often involving the unearthing of the secrets. Many times what we report is just what the public needs to know, but going beyond and unearthing the secrets. And other notes that it, its practice often involves heavy use of public records and computer system reporting, as well as focus on social justice and accountability. And public records that is because of digitization and data, it's becoming a bit easier, but also there's lower regulations on um, the, data, uh, the data act that actually also prevent some of the public uh, um, data. So uh, I wanted to actually, the importance of uh, investigative journalism, what has actually been done, been seen so far, what is involved. Before I give an example of actually what, uh, uh, can I say Strathmore we've done, but also we can, try, can be translated into investigative journalism. Investigative journalism is seen as a mighty tool in an acting injustice, as I said, inequalities and abuses and provides hard data for criticism and complaints that it provides the truth and it has to be true it has to be ethical it, and you have to actually have that um, what do you call it um, people have to believe in you for you to be able to, to 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 make it work and the information can be used to enhance freedom of expression access to information which in the end has got coronary on press freedom but also as are impacted on certain, some journalists. Some journalists have, have lost their lives because of this. All these are both fundamental rights as well as an enablers for the, the realization of the justice. But a high impact looking at the first century is the way that uh, the question about the distinctive role of news media in the face of many new actors, both individuals and institutions, which are slowly becoming central in the ways in which the public can access and use information. And this actually has an impact on the way even media manages its newsroom. Yet investigative journalism is expected to be still the same, it's still that kind of the tool that is like the core tool for the media industry. 
So when uh, we talked about how investigative journalists can address the impact of illegal business on environment, one of the slides I wanted to see is, uh, is to show you actually is just a, a tweet I, I witnessed today of uh, uh, a pickup carrying a charcoal, heavily loaded, passing uh, Nairobi. Uh, no, in, in DRC, not Nairobi. And uh, the Twitter, that is Dr. Susan Chomba said, we counted um, hundreds of these vans and lorries ferrying charcoal in Kinshasa today, a city of 17 million people, most of who rely on charcoal as a source of energy. And look at that, you know, 17 million rely on charcoal. And uh, every day, uh, a pickup ferrying charcoal and a Sorry, country Rosemary, that is seen you can share green. your slides now. Yes. Can we have a, a look at <laughs> okay, that okay. picture you wanted us to see? Okay. Let me go. I can share it. Okay. Yeah, so this is the picture that I was showing. That uh, we, you know, and uh, at a time when climate change is becoming an issue, and uh, because also media, we are part of the society, sometimes some things can bypass us. And yet some of these things, we don't have to be investigative journalism to be the big, you know, scandal about uh, corruption. But even the things that are happening on our backyard, Look at this charcoal in uh, DRC. It's also charcoal even in our in our homeland here. Alternative energy sources must be on the table if we want to save the Congo Basin forest, but also even if we want to save our forest. I'll show you later on about the whole forest. And when we talk about carbon zero and also um, the monetization of uh, carbon emission, it's uh, DRC is actually at the core of Africa for doing that. And linking that to an investigative journalism is critical. It's not just about carbon. It's about also saving the lives of the people. And shocking indeed, if we don't address the demand for the charcoal in urban center, it will be too late even here in Nairobi. And everything else depends on climate action, as, as, we, as we have seen. And um, when, uh, like the Mao forest, uh, when Mao forest, there was a lot of um, uh, deforestation in the area and the government took an action, there was a lot of cry and creating awareness among the Maasai actually brought that to our heart because they said, look, we, were, we are the sufferer. When this is raining in the Mao forest and uh, it rains, the Narok become flooded because of the impact of uh, the, the heavy rain and uh, also lack of, uh, lack of uh, the forest. So when the uh, ordinary, uh, what do you call it, the community radio took up the, the importance of even the Maasai uh, getting involved in afforestation, they took up and the governor took up the matter because they're saying that in 20 years, if we don't do it, the place is going to, going to become actually a river. And that's what we say that going beyond, beyond the story, in depth in uh, the, the story, but also putting awareness and creating an impact among the community. So at Strathmore, uh, when uh, we were part of, just uh, so that you can see example of my own data, um, example of uh, how Strathmore uh, actually introduced African regional data kits uh, in, in Africa in partnership with um, Amazon, uh, uh, NASA as well as Amazon Web uh, Services at the government of Kenya, as well as uh, the various uh, four governments in the region. It was 2018. We were actually given the mandate to um, host this data. And uh, NASA for the last 17 years have been analyzing data going back over the 60 years of Africa on geospatial and geoinformation. When Emma was talking about geo geojournalism, I was looking at uh, even what we had already done now from a technical point of view of posting this data. And this is where actually showing this information using the special information. The government was able to actually say that we need this information, which that somebody can even write to us using a storytelling format. And uh, we were able to train some of the 
keep people to actually uh, use this. So the, where there's red is the countries where we actually, Tanzania, Kenya, Ghana, uh, Guinea, and uh, Sierra Leone. They are the countries that uh, attended the training as their leaders. So this is how, are you able to see? Sure. Um, yes, we can. I wanted to. This is how that data was uh, was hosted. I hope you are able to see because it uh, looks like uh, that Strathmore were entitled to host the data for Kenya, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Ghana, and it was about using Landsat and Sentinel and Sentinel Two. And I, I don't know how many of you journalists have actually access to this. And uh, this data keeps management who are able to manage it the information. So anybody who wants how um, uh, 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 Mao was in, the, in 1960, were able to show them and how Mao is, is now and what has impacted and the stories around the issues that have occurred. Were able to show using uh, visualization and data to be able to show these uh, changes about weather, changes about land, changes about environment, changes about this. And uh, I'm just showing this, but I'm saying that um, investigative journalism um, equipped and actually um, and, uh, can be enhanced by additional information that can be provided either by the government or by experts that have already uh, analyzed the uh, issues and to be able to take you through and use it so that it can have a greater impact. So, the, it, like, uh, for example, the impact on um, Africa um, uh, regional data on Earth. It was a 20 algorithm plus 17 years of data. We were able to get cloud-free mosaic uh, on all these um, applications. And of course, spectral indices and uh, well, part of the things that are being used. But the land change was critical uh, uh, in, in, in how uh, people were able to see each and every when they could analyze because we trained the senior government officers to be able to show share with them that uh, getting that knowledge was critical for them. Some of the journalists that attended also were if they just sharing a 13% loss. In 2017, using a Google Earth, they started showing this. By 2017, there was nothing. And actually, it showed the unknown that the location for illegal mining provided by the Ghana, Ghana, uh, Ghana. But the whole idea was actually pointing potential hot point for what a warrant of investigation for both um, time and money. And when they investigated, it wasn't illegal mining. It was actually the whole idea of, um, sorry, it was illegal mining. And because people wanted to uh, look for money uh, very fast and save both time, they could actually uh, go near the ocean where they could now bring down the forest. And when we um, actually, uh, for Ghana, even the president attended this, he said he took over a policy how he was going to address this. And coming back later, he actually was saying that he has been able to interest the community that cocoa, cocoa farming is much bigger than the gold mining that was affecting uh, their, their forest. And cocoa farming is going to enhance. And that way they have been able to, even to enhance and increase even their GDP because of the change of policy of unearthing the hidden information that was showcasing music there special data that uh, they were able to access. Um, Sorry, Rosemary, if you could shorten uh, your presentation <laughs> so that we can have other people to present as well. Our time is yeah, against us. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, yes. In Tanzania, again, the forest we were able to showcase. I'm sharing that so that you can see how, how um, connecting your story with uh, supporting document and vision is critical. And then... Um, uh, in Sierra Leone, the urbanization also, before 2000 and 2000, because of the geospatial. So I'm going to go very fast here. Some of the impact that we had in Kenya here, that conservation using actually earth-observing satellite to locate invasive species, species 
threatening livestock and, livestock and, and, and landscape. People are able to actually pinpoint where they are, how they are. In the case of the Kenyan tea, the case of Ebu, Ebu, um, a tea pla a potato planting were some of the cases that they were able to see. So going to what have we learned about it, that having infrastructure and access to data, a necessary tool as a journalist, can be of great uh, impact to the, to, the, to the profession. But most critical is the leadership buy-in, because uh, both the media owner and the editor, sometimes you can bring a story and maybe the leader is not interested. But also, maybe the leader has got certain interest with the power that is. So using that, even if you can showcase, the leader's buy-in is critical, but you have to use the word of, that is not threatening to them by using all this, uh, what we call uh, visualization format of the case of your story. So this calls for learning extra skills, as uh, alluded by Emma. And extra skills that we can say, data is okay, but learning how to use various programs and approaches to these skills is critical. Application, there's the Python, there's the program R, there's you know the various application that needs to be known as for you to be able to understand. But also it requires strategic planning and how to integrate all these activity, uh, investigative journalism in all everything that you do. So there is need to use innovation and also give compelling stories that combine both data and public records. So in conclusion, the mission of investigative journalism should be based on creativity and no innovation, ability to solve problems, not only just inform, ethical grounding while you're doing it, use of corp uh, corporate database and even public uh, database. Of course, uh, core, uh, core skills are critical and the importance of learning how to use desktop research archives, not just so and so said, so and so told me. And the other thing is that the key factor is the art of storytelling by like capturing the hearts and minds of people. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, Frederick, as you share your presentation as well, I know that you have worked with uh, a number of journalists in the Nile Basin, so you could also speak to us about the importance of working together when it comes to executing such assignments in the environment. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I request uh, Mary, Rosemary to uh, let me share. I say she's still on. Ah, okay. Um, no, I'm not able to share. I see host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, probably someone can carry on me. as as share. they work on the issue. You can share. You ah, can okay. share now. Ah, ah. Mm. You can share now. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Yeah. So um. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Frederick Mujer, as you said. Uh, I'm a journalist. I've been writing about water, you know, uh, climate change, and wildlife for several years. And also, uh, I, uh, I'm the founder of Water Journalist Africa and the co-founder of Info Nile. Uh, well, the, the photo you are seeing over there is uh, a photo that you will go from one of our journalists. Uh, uh, from Sudan, South Sudan, these are impalas that had been killed in a uh, national park uh, in, uh, who are working on the, the geojournalism project that we brought together journalists from the region to uh, uh, put together stories on wildlife, on what happened during uh, COVID, uh, what happened to the wildlife. Yeah, so then I just want to let you know how we are uh, working with uh, geojournalism and you know collaborative journalism and you know to expose environmental crimes in the region. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes. Uh, what I've done is Africa is a network of about 700 journalists spread across 50 countries. Uh, we are journalists, so purely journalists who write about water. And then uh, under Water Journalists Africa, we have a flagship project called uh, Info Nile. Uh, so Info Nile is a collaborative cross-border group of geojournalists. Our mission is to uncover critical stories on water issues in the 11 countries in the Nile Basin. Uh, so um, under um, InfoNile, we, we do tell different stories. So our approach is that uh, 
we you know focus on local and international storytelling on environment and scientific topics so what do we do i'm just building on what rosemary and emma you know talked about what do we do we identify a theme of common and cross-border importance uh, in the past we have identified by the first thing as only lakes past pollution of lake victoria uh, water scarcity during COVID-19, climate change solutions, wildlife trafficking and conservation. That's the photo I showed you there and foreign land deals, where we uh, you know, worked with Port for Africa and produced the sucked dry as Emma showed you. So what do we do under uh, these projects? As we do investigations, we source for credible data that is cross-cutting you know, across countries because we, we, we believe in uh, uh, collaborative journalism. And we strongly believe that these resources are cross-cutting. They're not only in Uganda or Kenya, but they're in different countries. So it's very important to tell the story of all these countries, not just you know, nationalistic stories. So in the past, we've looked at fish species, fish species diversity, and stocks. Uh, we are still working on this. They are, they are focused on Lake Victoria. And uh, we have also looked at, at wildlife trafficking seizures, you know, data on what access uh, you know, in the region rainfall and runoff and land acquisitions. Yeah, so uh, what we do uh, at InfoNile, because we are journalists, eh, we are in a network of journalists, so we we call, when we get grants, eh, we call for journalists, so they apply and, you know, uh, they send in pitches, they apply, and then we share the, the money that we get, uh, we share with all those that go through, so to write stories that we publish with our own our other media houses. InfoNile or Water Journalists Africa are not uh, media houses, they're just networks of journalists that bring together the journalists. So we have had about 200 stories produced and as I say, uh, since 2016 20, uh, when InfoNile started. So we maintain and train journalists in data journalism. Uh, we've worked with Port for Africa as Emma indicated to do this and we have had over one, 150 journalists trained in data journalism, purely data journalism. So then we let the journalists publish these stories in their local media houses, often in local languages. We've had about 200 stories published by members of InfoNile and other journalists in Africa. We help translate these stories into different languages. And so we have had these stories published, you know, uh, translated into Amharic, Arabic, Swahili, French, because we have coordinators in different regions. We have a coordinator in Sudan, a coordinator in, in Ethiopia, a coordinator in Kenya, a coordinator in uh, Tanzania and Rwanda. This is, so at number seven, this is why we, we create cross-border multimedia projects. So these cross-border multimedia projects incorporate geojournalism techniques and tools. This is where we combine all local stories and cross-border you know, data analysis and incorporate uh, visualizations, you know, uh, geojournalism visualizations such as interactive maps, drone videos, photography, satellite imagery, and, gra gra and uh, graphics. Uh, Emma talked about all of this. I'm just going through this, eh? like she said. So we've had, we've had about you know eight, eight to ten projects that we've worked on since 2016, and then we create actionable and uh, you know uh, interactive maps that we publish with these stories. Uh, yeah. So then, I just want to show you uh, some of the techniques that we, we use, geojournalism techniques, to tell investigative stories with, with, with data generated by art science. Um, you would wonder really what you know, geojournalism is all about, but that's what it's all about, you know, telling stories uh, with data generated by the art sciences. And we've been you know, telling investigative stories uh, in the past using uh, satellite imagery, as you can see right there. So satellite imagery is just the eyes in the sky. They will show you, you know, they will help you to monitor vegetation areas, for example, track droughts. So you are able to see what is going on as you are up there, as you are, as, as, as if you are up there. So you, are, you use it, you know, to measure, track, and identify, for example, human activity that is going on uh, when you see from up. And this is what we've been doing, you know, using uh, since then. Uh, juxtaposition, juxtaposition, posing. We've been doing this for some time because when you juxtapose, 
you are able to help readers make a comp comparison. Be able to bring what was there, for example, and before 10 years ago, and what is there right now. So you, you kind of, uh, I mean, help the, the reader to, to look at how things were, uh, you know, 10 years ago, maybe two years ago, depending on the, um, the time you want to use, and how they are right now. So you kind of com uh, compare, helps you to compare and contrast. Um, yeah, I'm just going through this uh, uh, quickly. Uh, time lapse, we've used time lapse uh, for some time, and we are now able, you know, we are able to, to show, for example, if you use, you can use videos if you want, you can use for, for, uh, for photos, you can use uh, satellite imagery uh, to show, you know, how things have changed over time. And we've been using this for some time. You, you know very well, like, you know, how we've been uh, watching videos. And you, for example, you watch a video of a flower growing at the beginning and it comes in the end. Uh, we have, I have watched, for example, videos of where, uh, you know, wildlife uh, filmmakers have pressed cameras uh, in, in national parks for 25 years, just leave it there and it captures, you know, it shoots. Uh, for all those 25 years, yeah. So it helps you to, to you know, to move from uh, at the beginning to the end, and uh, you know, you move with time to see how things are going to change. All this will help you as a journalist to investigate to show us what has been happening over the years, not just what happened yesterday or today. Yeah, again, we have been we are using uh, drone images. Eh? Uh, so we, we again we look at these scenes from the skies. Uh, we do uh, use these aerial images, which help us to reach out to different, you know, difficult areas that you may not walk to, but you are able to, you know, uh, send the drone and uh, um, yeah. So you capture this, all this. For example, you can use such a you know images you know, to capture volcanic eruptions. Yeah, you know, war, war torn villages, you know, natural disasters, you know, such a process. Yeah, yeah. So I, because, you know, this all supports your investigations. You will not only just write texts and, you know, end your investigations. You want to see, you want to take us as readers, to take us to the scene, to, you know, to see. Again, yeah, uh, we use data. Uh, data is credible, it is easy to understand and puts news in, you know. In context. We've used the data, we've worked with work for Africa, you know, we help do all these uh, visualizations and, uh, you know, uh, these help to simplify our investigation. Okay. Yeah, what you are seeing over there is a wetland in Uganda called the Natural Wetland, so we are able to uh, draw it and uh, give it percentages so, of you know, how it's used. Uh, again, we use mapping. Yeah, we've been using mapping for some time. And uh, what you're seeing over there is a part of the project that we worked on called Thirsty in the River Basin. And we looked at, you know, uh, how areas that we are facing water scarcity, we are coping up with, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID. Uh, yeah, so then we, we did all this mapping and were able again to tag stories that we worked on this that you see red, you know, green stuff. Yeah, so maps will help you or help the reader understand the full context of the story. What I like most is that these maps will help you uh, or even the reader to locate the story. You know, where the story happens is as important as what happens in the story. Because, you know, when we read the story, we want to know where it took us from. And then if we have these maps, you are able you know, to draw a, a bigger conclusion, you know, looking at uh, the surrounding, you know, other areas. So we are able, you know, to conclude, not from what you're writing to us in the text, but also what you're able to, to see. So then I will take you through uh, briefly about lessons learned as we do this, you know. We realize that, uh, So we realize that storytellers and media houses still choose to go it alone instead of collaborating. I've told you that we've been working on this with the different journalists, but most of you know media houses want to do it alone. They don't care you know working with others. 
is little or no exposure data journalism most journalists in the region you know don't know about data journalism little or no exposure to collaborative journalism like i told you they don't want to work with others in some countries issues of transboundary resources are not open to the public i told you this these are transboundary resources they are they cut across countries but uh, you know these issues are not too, you know open to the public. little budgets to take on expensive projects like you've seen you know, concentration on easy to report topics such as in entertainment and politics and leaving out such investigations, deep investigations, you know, competition versus collaboration. Some people want to compete instead of collaborating that we, from our own media houses, also in, you know, in our countries. We know that media houses want to compete instead of collaborating, which is not right. Frederick this is the last slide. Yes. Yeah, this is the last slide. Yeah, so then uh, why is this approach important? In a, again, it enables journalists in their houses to go far beyond what they may not be able to achieve on their own. Partnership and networking opportunities are available right there. Like, you know, you are able to partner with different media houses, different countries, funding opportunities, pitching, you know, easy to link with scientists, you know, mentorship opportunities, uh, uh, like being mentoring journalists in that journalism enables regional or global effects. It, you can look at the Pandora papers that you know involve media outlets in 117 countries. These media house media outlets never worked alone. They collaborated. Thank you so much. This is what I have. Thank you, Frederick. Um, okay. So Ronald, as you come in, I know that you have done a couple of stories on poaching, deforestation, and ivory. And the burden of proof surely rests upon the journalists in trying to execute these stories. So share how you went through gathering your information and ensuring that it was factual. Because if you do not do this, then you're likely to be sued or your reputation will go down the drain. Mm. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for, 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 for these uh, important uh, questions. And uh, thank you so much uh, to my three senior colleagues for having uh, uh, ably elaborated on uh, what environmental journalism uh, entails, especially in this part of, uh, of Africa, East Africa. Uh, we have so many issues uh, going on around uh, the region. Uh, we've got plenty of uh, natural resources, and uh, most, of our, most of our economies actually depend on these uh, uh, resources uh, to, 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 to contribute to, directly to the national coffers. Yes, uh, you asked me uh, to share with you two stories. Uh, I've been a journalist, uh, I think, since 2008. And uh, I do, uh, I trained as an environmental journalist, although in, in my newsroom, which is a bit small, I am um, able to do so many other bits. But uh, specifically on the environment, I, uh, let me just share two stories. Uh, one which was done, uh, I think, around uh, 2018, and uh, the other one which I did early this year, the one of 2018 was uh, 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 following, following up on uh, the issue of uh, pangolin poaching. Uh, this, uh, it's, it's a small mammal with uh, lots of scales on its body. It's uh, one of the most sought after <laughs> animals, uh, and uh, it, it ends up in, uh, in the Asia, uh, China, the South Asia, Southeast Asia mainly it's uh, China, Vietnam mainly. So the market or the source of these, of, of these animals is uh, uh, apart from uh, Nigeria, Cameroon, DRC, Uganda, and uh, parts of Kenya. It's a, it's a, essentially, they call it the, the pangolin belt. It's, it's, it's just that uh, region stretching from Nigeria up to around Kenya. So in, tw in 2018, I was, uh, I was uh, intrigued by, I had gotten a tip that uh, there was some sort of uh, increase in, in, in these animals being uh, trafficked out of Uganda. And uh, I was told, I was tipped that uh, one of the key sources of uh, these animals was uh, somewhere around uh, the northwest. There's a, a park in north, sort of northern, but towards uh, the west, northwestern Uganda, called Machine Falls National Park. It's, it's just around uh, the Nile. So around uh, about that time, 
there is uh, uh, a power project which is actually going on, uh, and it was being, uh, it's, 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 I think it's going to be commissioned this year, but it, was, it has been built by the Chinese, and there's definitely a connection between the Chinese and uh, Pangolin. So, I couldn't just report this story from, uh, from my desk uh, in, in Kampala. I, luckily enough, uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, the power of collaboration, the power of, uh, of uh, sourcing for funds. So, Thomson Reed, I was on a program which, which, which was uh, partly investigative, partly, it was actually following up on uh, wildlife uh, crime. And this was a perfect opportunity for me to, to go and interact and establish whether what I was hearing was true. Uh, apparently one of the, my sources had told me that uh, the Chinese were involved. So I spent time, I think uh, I spent the course of uh, a week in northern Uganda around, around the, the, the power, the camp, sorry, the camp where, where, where these uh, Chinese uh, 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 contractors were situated, uh, and, and the idea was to see, talk to, talk to uh, the locals to see whether what I'm hearing is is, is true, and that's very important. Uh, verification is very important, and of course you have to collaborate later on with uh, with uh, with uh, key uh, government agencies like uh, like police. Uh, you have to collaborate to, to talk to maybe uh, environmental local environmental agencies, NGOs. In this case, uh, I collaborated with the Natural Resources uh, Conservation, I think, network, because its uh, forte is in uh, following up these uh, kind of issues. Um, so, in conclusion, at the end of the day, I, much as uh, I got one, and, and, and maybe I was lucky that uh, around about that time, uh, the police actually arrested uh, a Chinese nation, two, na two nationals at Entebbe, and they were flying out with uh, these uh, uh, pangolin skulls alongside, I think, elephant tusks. So that what I'm going to say is that uh, that uh, going on going on ground to verify uh, these uh, the, the, these uh, uh, allegations is very important for environmental journalism. It helps a lot to make your story more credible. Um, maybe the other story I did early this year, and. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, bring in the issue of uh, technology. I, this is something which has been coming up over the last two days, uh, and it, came, it, it also came up uh, early this morning, mid, no, no, early, early afternoon this uh, today uh, during the the water and trees uh, session. Uh, again, I was lucky to to get a fellowship. Uh, I hope you understand when I keep on saying that I'm lucky. Or I've been lucky to. Uh, what has been stressed uh, over the last two days is that uh, doing some of these stories requires a lot of resources, and uh, you already know that uh, most of our newsrooms are constrained. So again, I was uh, lucky this uh, early this year to get uh, a fellowship uh, with uh, Code for Africa, uh, together with uh, the Global Forest uh, uh, Forest Watch. I think you've heard that over and over since morning. Um, they've got a very, very, very powerful uh, tool. Uh, it's called the global. Uh, it's called the global. Uh, it's a satellite tool uh, for tracking uh, uh, areas, uh, huge spaces of 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 of, of, of land. So, so if you claim that maybe you are having uh, deforestation, the deforestation rates at this place is uh, is alarming. You have to prove it, and uh, the global forest watch comes in handy with its. Uh, with its uh, uh, tool, which actually uh, provides a satellite imagery. Uh, the latest satellite imagery, sometimes it's uh, two weeks old, and, and, and you can't find that anywhere else apart from, 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 from their tool. So my story was uh, uh, trying to confirm whether this uh, deforestation rate which is being reported is actually happening. And uh, I just just opposed that with another a program which has been ongoing for the last, uh, I think it's now coming to a decade. Uh, it's, it's a government program uh, run by uh, the UN Food and Agriculture uh, Organization and uh, the National Forest Authority of trying to uh, 
plant uh, forests in degraded areas. So what this tool was also able to tell me or to show me was that uh, there was a bit of, uh, of agreement uh, in, 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 in where you find uh, tree recovery, massive tree recovery in certain uh, districts, uh, especially around Kampala, is, 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 is uh, I mean, glad shows that there is recovery, yeah? So when I was able to, to go and verify this with, uh, with the, FAO, the, the FAO program, they were able to confirm that actually in, it is these areas where massive reforestation has been taking place. So I think most of these uh, tools have been shared by m most of my colleagues. I can't, I can't uh, bore my, my audience, both here in Nairobi and uh, online. We've, uh, we've, 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 we've got plenty of, uh, of, of tools for us to, to, to verify information before we publish. That's what I can say in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, Renald. So what I pick from all our presentations is that it's very important for us to use online tools to enable us um, um, digest the data on different topics. But also the issue of reading is important because one of my colleagues um, got a very big story from an internal audit in 2015 when um, I think 1,300 kilograms of ivory disappeared in, in, in uh, the Uganda Wildlife Authority and it was just an internal audit that, that unearthed this. And whereas we still do not know where that ivory went, at least it, um, uh, government was able to, to start taking stockpiles of ivory in the country. So reading, reading, and more reading is key. As we come to the, en um, the end of this session, I don't know whether there are any questions online for our panelists or in the audience. Maybe we can take one or two questions, reactions. Does our online audience have anything on earth crimes? No. What about the audience here? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was looking at the story that was done by okay, the such drug that was uh, highlighted by the Marquisa, and I think you are also involved. Is what? That? The sucked dry? Y yeah, I think it was done by um, the collaboration with the uh, court How is it, is, how easy is it for such a story and what kind of impact uh, do you get uh, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, doing such a collaborative story? Uh, mm -hmm. From policy angle, uh, yeah, uh, as from, uh, from policy, did it have an impact? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, to be to be honest, I wasn't part of the collaboration uh, that that particular story. Uh, so I think uh, either either Emma or Frederick will be able to, to answer that. But I can't em overemphasize the the, the, the the issue of uh, collaboration because uh, with it you are able to to do so much in such a short time, especially if you have uh, the team uh, or in agreement with what you are doing. If they, you pull together, definitely you achieve much. But Frederick can quickly maybe answer that. No, actually, um, Emma, Emma is yeah. better placed to speak about that. The story on Sucked Dry, how were you able to pull it off? Okay, I think that um, Frederick is equally better placed, placed to answer it, but I'll give you an answer. The, how easy was it? It was not an easy thing. We did this over months and finding the data, doing the, all the work, getting, because of collaboration, there are so many moving pieces. So getting all those moving pieces to align and have the whole project come out, it took a long time to do it. But then also we had people, the journalists were in different countries. So for this one, I'd like Fred to just talk about how the journalists were in different countries as well. Frederick, would you like yeah, to say so something? The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So for the Sacked Dry project, we worked with uh, uh, eight journalists from uh, eight countries in the Nile Basin. 
So what we did was when we got funding, we sent out a call for applications and journalists that right. We wanted to look at how you know foreign uh, companies are coming into the night, grabbing land, and what happens to you know those communities where you know that are already living on that grabbed land. And we got some amazing stories from different uh, uh, from different reporters. I will give you an example of you know, South Sudan, where you know foreign companies are coming, they grab land, they grab land. You know when the war started, they ran away. Uh, so then uh, they left land idle, there's nothing going on. But you know, co communities are suffering, they have nowhere to grow crops. So the same stuff happening in, you know, uh, in, in Sudan, in Egypt, where companies came from, uh, uh, especially uh, in so mid, mid, Middle East, uh, they came, you know, grab land, they are growing alfalfa, you know, they take uh, this animal feedback to their countries and with the profits. When you come back, for example, down uh, the night to Uganda, you find the, uh, companies from the West, from from Europe, you know, coming to grow uh, trees under uh, the carbon trade, but they are displacing communities, you know, around the Victoria. And then in Ethiopia, you know, companies coming to grow uh, flowers and then displace so many communities around there. Yeah, so then uh, uh, the title, Sucked Dry, we drew it from what we found because we realized that these companies, these uh, uh, investors are not coming to uh, the Nile Basin because of the land. What brings them is actually what is in the land. And in the land, that's the water of the Nile. So they are coming to suck the Nile. Thank you so much. Eh? Okay, thank you, Frederick. So I'll give each panelist a minute to give their parting shot. And I'll start with um, Rosemary, are you there? Rosemary, Emma, Frederick, and Reynolds in that order. Probably Emma, you could take it away as Rodri as uh, Rosemary gets on board. Thank you, Cecilia. Mm -hmm. My parting shot is that it's going to take time to get something good. It's going to take time. So if you are in a media house that has deadlines which is really good and you have to have a story at the end of every day at 5 p.m then you are going to have to request for more time to do a story that is covering the earth crimes and that is investigative and with the data that is needed and everything so it will take time and be ready to put in the time ronald has been talking about how he has been lucky and lucky and lucky and i just want to say that it's not luck. He put in the time and he put in the work. That is why opportunities come to him because they have seen that the work he has put in has grown fruit. So it's going to take time, but it is worth it. Thank you. Frederick? Uh, yeah, so I, I strongly believe that we as journalists, we must work to define familiarize our stories. Most of these stories we're working on are kind of growing old. If, for example, you look at climate change stories, they're kind of growing old. They are stories that have been there for 15 years, you know, people look at them. There's nothing you may give to me, for example, or maybe your communities. Those guys who are suffering in, in the villages, they know that because of the changes in the weather and stuff like that, they are not able to run, they are not able to you know, run at the right time, but we must defamiliarize these stories and bring them in, in another form that they, that you know we attract readers. If we make the widely known and unknown and a common, we are likely to again attract readers to these same stories that we, they had you know uh, neglected. And if we take an example of the youth. If, for example, you use uh, geojournalism techniques, you bring in drones, drone you know, bring in. Um, videos and stuff like that you are likely to attract the youth back to these stories you know then get them off the social media and then make make sure they, they read these long stories because they are attracted again it's very important also it attracts you know scientists who do not attract uh, you know trust journalists they think that journalists are misrepresenting their info but if, if we work with them and they give us this data and we publish it we will also make them our readers and our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frederick. Um, Rosemary, are you there? Is Rosemary still with us? 
Okay, uh, Frederick, you could conclude. Uh, Ronald, I, I mean guess. Ronald. Uh, thank sorry. you so much. Uh, my parting shot is actually uh, for uh, the young journalists uh, interested in this uh, field. I think I'm going to disagree with uh, the city what you said earlier on that uh, environment, environment tends to be boring. I disagree. I think uh, the environmental bit is one of the most important bits, especially for us here in uh, sub-Saharan Africa because most of our populations depend on these natural resources for survival. Yeah? So it's important that we raise the issues every other day or every other time we see an opportunity of raising them. I think uh, the other thing that we, we have an, a better opportunity of telling these stories now with, uh, now that we are exposed to this uh, uh, number of uh, online tools. Uh, environmental journalism remains uh, a very, very expensive uh, venture. Uh, not be, but bit compared to these other bits like uh, maybe politics. I think you can do politics uh, <laughs> at your desk and, and, and the story will pass. Uh, environmental journalism most times requires you to, to travel to the field. We have issues with funding, but that should not stand in, in, in our way. It starts with the passion. It starts with the passion to tell these stories. And um, I encourage us to, 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 to read a little more, familiarize ourselves with, uh, with, with these concepts. Let's, let's not, be, uh, let's not uh, be, let's not have that phobia. I, just because I don't have the time, but I, at first, uh, maybe three, four years, ago, I had a phobia for numbers, uh, data journalism, but the more I've been uh, interacting with, with, uh, with the colleagues at uh, Code for Africa and uh, InfoNile, uh, Frederick's uh, uh, very interesting organization, I've come to sort of get uh, familiar, f familiarized with these shows and I can now ably report and I think it's quite exciting for me to, 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 to do these stories. So let's, let's do the stories. Thank you. Okay. okay, so the tall and short of this session is that we need to collaborate more. We need to unpack data through utilizing the online uh, tools that are available. And then it doesn't have to be political. Investigative journalism can, can also thrive in other areas. And then we need to gain extra skills and to read and learn more about what is happening out there. Um, we also need to look out for grants because investigative journalism is a costly venture and so grants will help us execute our work well. Um, I liked what Frederick said about translating stories to local languages because this now touches the, the, the different audiences that we serve. So whenever there's an opportunity, we could also take look into that. And finally, going down on ground to verify allegations. You, you cannot do an investigative story with just hearsay. So we also need to frequently go down and uh, see what's in the field. Otherwise, I thank you for this opportunity and for uh, enabling me moderate this session. Have a good evening to our online audience and to our people here.